Welcome to Pharmacy View, technology and pharmacy business podcast series, where we provide regular interviews with pharmacists and key industry people within the Australian pharmacy and associated industry. In each podcast, we look to discuss aspects of pharmacy operation and how technology is improving or interacting with each guest's current role or pharmacy-related business. I'm your host, Scott Carpenter, and today's guest is sponsored by Shopfront Solutions, leading the way in digital marketing and communications, providing a cloud-based platform for pharmacies to manage all of their digital messaging and print-based collateral. For more information on the Shopfront Solutions digital platform, simply go to the website at shopfrontsolutions.com.au. I'm talking today with pharmacist Mark Feldshu, who I had the pleasure to talk with a few months ago in our Strong Room podcast episode. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Scott. I'm very pleased to be here. It's certainly great to catch up again, and, and we've certainly stayed in touch um, since our last episode. And the more I guess that we talk, the more I have a fascination about your uh, your life and career history, particularly as a pharmacist. Um, relative, I guess, to this podcast, um, what I, I quickly realised I thought would be a benefit um, is your passion, I guess, for pharmacy. Uh, it certainly uh, comes out very strongly, um, helping business owners, and particularly, I guess, the interaction of technology. So. Um, that's, I guess, what we're going to talk about today. But I guess before we get into that, for those that may not have listened to the podcast episode, let's just talk a little bit about you and your history and where you've come from. Okay, thanks very much, Scott. Yeah, uh, as you know, I'm, I've been a pharmacist and uh, only, I've only basically practised in Victoria, a teensy, teensy bit in New South Wales, and that's it. And um, the I got into it when I was about age 21. I, I, I graduated, etc., I was very lucky. My first job was as a manager, and then my second job was as a manager also. Uh, and I did a bit of locuming, actually, when I think about it, a lot in New South Wales, but just for a few months. Uh, anyway, after my second uh, management role, uh, I got offered to buy the pharmacy instead of buying a house, which is what I was going to be doing. Uh, so yep. uh, that worked out really, really well. And in fact, as I recollect, the uh, and I was I was very young at the time. I was twenty three, which is another story. And uh, how I bought it was on some sort of terms. And I had this little book booklet. I had a sort of sign uh, with my payments. And I remember I was paying it off for three years, one month at a, uh, every month. I don't even know the name of the instrument, which I'm sure it's not even. Uh, I'm positive it's not around. But after three years, it was mine. And uh, I was sort of very, very happy in that first pharmacy, which is called, which is called Belvedere Park Pharmacy in Seaford, Victoria, and that okay. allowed me to do a lot of different things, uh, which I, I'm sure we'll go through. Uh, yeah. uh, and I guess over the time, again, certainly in, in recent years, you've had a lot to do with uh, helping other pharmacy business owners and with, with your time at the PSA. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I'm... I was a part of a few different buying groups, etc., and uh, we always helped each other. I just remember very early on, uh, there was three of us in different areas of Melbourne with your own pamphlets. Well, be, uh, I was always in AMCAL, and that was pretty good, but uh, I was able to sort of do other marketing things on top of it. And I do remember one of my first sort of coups was Tonka Toys, which is quite funny. So we're selling a lot of those and then electronic games and all sorts of things. But the back to uh, how sort of I hope I help people. I used to go on a lot of conferences and sort of see new ideas and obviously I learned from other people. And uh, you certainly should be giving back to the same people, which was easy to do, especially if they weren't in competition. And uh, the, the, my, I was lucky that where I was, there was really no close competition and any competition I had was very sort of, uh, I don't know what the word is, not manageable, but uh, very friendly. So, and a bit of cooperation and, you know, swap stock, etc. cetera. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah, all of that. And I, I really enjoyed professional development, uh, or CPD, uh, or PD, and um, I got into PSA and sort of lobbied a lot of things and went to conferences and I eventually ended up as the 
um, the president of CPD Victoria PSA and also eventually became president of PSA for Victoria, which enabled me to do basically anything I wanted to <laughs> that was reputable, yep. etc. And uh, I really enjoyed advocacy and, as I said, PD. And it was just very easy and, you know, things have changed, but still cooperation is fine. And one of my big things was the idea of using systems. Uh, and I got that from a book called The E-Myth, as in Entrepreneur by Michael Gerber. Very old now, but the systems approach was brilliant. So I was always trying to steal uh, any ideas uh, on systemization uh, from anyone. I actually, the best I ever did was with McDonald's. And I actually grabbed at one stage a regional manager of McDonald's and it was a she, and she really helped me with systems. So I love the idea of things. And really one of the one which was really, really simple was uh, walk as the customer walks into the pharmacy. So just on nine o'clock, someone actually had to go out the front door right outside and then walk all the way back into the dispensary with a checklist. Uh, yep. so sometimes it was me, sometimes it was a shop assistant, uh, sometimes it was another pharmacist, but it was amazing what you could learn from that. Uh, just even empty boxes, uh, you know, signs not right. And very, very simple, but uh, a bit like when uh, car dealers or insurance agents used to send you a Christmas card or, or yes. and a birthday card. It's such an yep. easy, it was such an easy thing to do and everyone knew about it, but I guarantee not many actually executed on it. So you've got to walk the talk uh, and do it. Uh, so that's, there's some of the things I learned and uh, obviously people around me sort of picked that up too, which I was very yeah. pleased to help. Yeah, and, and look, that's a really good prop there because I, I, I certainly came through a similar era. Uh, and again, I guess where technology is taken over today is the uh, the use of the social media platforms. And whilst you, you you may or may not still send a birthday card or a note, um, certainly in the businesses that I'm involved with, either in my own businesses or the ones that I uh, provide business support to, what we do now is we make sure that we do this kind of regular activity on our social media. So again, it's um, it's about being out there, it's bit about, I guess, marketing yourself, letting people know what you are doing or what you can do, and, and ultimately they're, they're, you know, it may not be today, but it might be you know, three months down the track that someone rings you up and said, hey, I, I remember seeing something that you did you know, a couple of months ago, can you come and help me with that? And, and I think ultimately that's that regular repetition, um, not, not going overboard with uh, technology, because if you do it too much, you know, people can potentially get um, harassed and turned off, but certainly, I guess, uh, keep you know, keep the, uh, the branding going, which just sounds like what you were doing. Yeah, as long as you do anything with integrity and really not trying to sort of con anyone, and in pharmacy, always thought you'd do something in the patient's best interest as long as it was totally legal. If you did that, it'd be hard to get in trouble. Trouble, yeah. yeah. And look, I, the other thing I, you mentioned a little bit early on, and I, it was, would be... Uh, just over 20 years ago when I, I joined the pharmacy industry, which was a, a huge learning curve for me, um, again, coming out of, a, I guess, a, a, a retail, uh, a major, major retail chain model, um, was the whole stock swap thing between pharmacies because you were in competition with each other um, and you could actually have a pharmacy, you know, two doors down from you and, and you may not actually talk, but there was this unwritten rule that if you needed to help each other out with stock for a customer, you would do that irrespective of, of you know, how much of a competitor you were. Exactly. But the only thing there was the the part of that reciprocity was that you you were expected uh, to pay your debt very quickly. And uh, I'm, I'm not aware that anyone ever asked for it, but you certainly knew if someone didn't. You know, it was it, even if it was a very small amount of money. It was very irritating, which is uh, yeah. almost I petty, so. but it's an honour. It's an honour thing, isn't it? And I think that's what I've really enjoyed about the pharmacy industry in, in my time is that there is this you know, peership, there is this, you know, irrespective of who you might be or who you might be involved with, is that you know, there's a, a general understanding that you're there to help each other out, that, you know, and to, the, to you and your business, but also to the industry as a whole, which I think is you know, really, really valuable. 
Correct. Yeah, yeah. I love that part of the yeah. profession. Yeah. So, Mark, I know from one of our earlier conversations, um, and, and again, you and I are not going to give our ages away. People can, can judge that as, as they want. But, uh, you know, I, I remember you uh, chatting to me offline about the, um, the manual recording of transactions and, uh, uh, you know, I guess even uh, services, and, and I guess you know, talk to us a bit about the journey of that from from I guess the paper base to today's technology. Okay, well, it's, I find this really fascinating. Uh, the first thing is the ninety nine percent of the audience hopefully doesn't know what a script book is, the prescription book, and you wrote all the prescriptions in this book, and you did it uh, sequentially, so uh, prescription after prescription as they came in. And uh, the then when oh, well, uh, I certainly the PBS or the NHS as it was known started I think about 1951 something like that so I'm not uh, I didn't start pharmacy then of course but uh, mm -hmm. when I was involved when the PBS had repeats which I think was always that uh, I was always involved with call them repeat pads from the NHS at the time, and you had to hand write them. And uh, I do remember when I was getting busy, which is quite often, I had to hand write all the same garbage, all the name and addresses for the same patient. They had three or four repeats. And as you got busy, your hand was almost shaking because you're trying to speed it up and you didn't care if you couldn't read it or not, almost. So that happened. And the other part of that with the prescription book, the fascinating thing was that the you couldn't actually cross-reference what the patient was on with anything else. There was no history, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a really sort of interesting time. And someone actually, uh, I did a bit of work. I did my, I think, second year um, training with Jeff Sussman, and he's well known for wound care, etc. now, but... What he's less known for is things like he was actually CEO of Mover for years and he was okay. a professional diving coach, opera singer, all sorts of things. But one of the things he did was that he had a, uh, a file that you, you wrote the prescription into the book as normal. Uh, no, you didn't write it in. You actually had a file. and I think you had to write a note of the prescription detail in a book first, just probably name and address and maybe even what it was on, but you had a card on each patient. And so mm -hmm. you then wrote it in the patient's file, which was revolutionary. And yep. it got quite full. And the problem was that you had to put, you had to sort of pull out the card and put it back in. And my nails and my fingernail, and my, my, the tip of my fingers were cut like anything. So I used to go <laughs> home every day with yeah. hands stinging, which, which is what I remember. People today will just never know the pain, will they, Mark? <laughs> no, this was such a stupid <laughs> thing. Almost could get workers' comp on stinging nails. <laughs> uh, and the other thing which I recollect, which is not uh, necessarily Jeff's, this is, I think, after... The, when you had computers first come in, uh, two two real noises. The first one in Australia, which is huge, the dot matrix printers just humming or clank, yeah. clacking, and that was the main noise you found in a pharmacy in Australia. Um, I used to visit the US every year, for which we might go through later, and mm -hmm. the, uh, what I noticed there, that the matrix, dot matrix printers were going, but the number one noise was the um, the phones going with modems for adjudication. Each prescription had to be adjudicated by what they call a HMO, Health Insurance mm -hmm. Company, and was by the patient, dis you dispensed, or you, you were attempting to dispense something for a patient, you then had to uh, ring or uh, trigger the modem and get it adjudicated before you could get paid. So mm -hmm. you, I presume you actually you dispensed, adjudicated, and gave it out. If it, if it hadn't been approved, 
you probably had to underspense it. I never sort of got into that, but that was the yeah. huge noise and a really awful system. Uh, so that's they're the main things I recollect, I suppose. And the main, the other one was my first computer uh, cost me, and I remember twenty eight thousand dollars. Probably, yeah. I'd guess in the very late seventies. Early a maybe eighty one, and uh, that was well over the cost of a pharmacist for uh, over, well over a year, probably two to three years, I guess. But um, yeah, they were the good old days. <laughs> right, yeah, and, and I think uh, again, you and I spoke off, offline some time before. You know, my my background was not being entirely in pharmacy. You certainly you know, come from a bit of a mathematics background, and. Uh, I certainly look at the transition from uh, slide rule to uh, scientific calculator or basic calculator to scientific calculator through, through my uh, period of time. And, and I think the only thing that's missing on mine is that I never actually had to use an abacus, maybe, except when I was a two-year-old. And uh, in the scheme of things, what we've seen is this you know, technology um, coming through you know, every everyday life, um, from, from education through to today communication, marketing and, and online shopping and ordering it and ultimately that's all impacted so impacted possibly yeah, mostly positively but, but in some cases negatively on the pharmacy industry and I guess that raises a really good question that uh, I ask quite a few of my guests is that the, the plethora of um, apps available in pharmacy today you know, must be you know, time and mind consuming and so uh, as a pharmacist um, how would you guide someone to to look or research around what what's the best app for them or what's the best program for them? Now, when when you say app, so I presume you're meaning patients focused or you know yeah. from the, the the patient looks at. Uh, well, yeah. the for a start, the apps yeah are not where uh, the, call it the back office is going, but the front yeah. of store, as in. Uh, dealing with the patient or the patient dealing with you is you, yeah. you, you've obviously got to you've got to work out who your suppliers are, your professional suppliers, yeah. dispensing program, etc., and then work with them to find the the best called the apps or systems. But you've got to go through a systems approach for the apps, so you don't just get an app. And obviously, yeah. you're, you're trying to get the for start whatever the custom what makes a customer easy uh, to deal with you, but then it's, you've got to work out how it fits in to other things you're doing and how it integrates into the pharmacy. Um, the, the, a better analogy may be that always, uh, I see a lot of apps that uh, company, uh, I do some consulting for different companies trying to get into pharmacy, etc. The biggest problem I see is someone comes up with a an app that's a consumer app, and they're actually saying uh, that oh this is terrific you've got to resell it for the customer or the customer will come in and you've got to help them with it. Uh, if you the way I look at it the gold standard is that if there's if there's medical information and then advice needed. You've got to see where does it actually impact the patient. And in most cases, the way it works is that uh, if the app uh, takes measurement, the, the person who adjudicates what, that, what the hell that all means is most likely the doctor. So what has to happen is that at a minimum, the data has to appear on the in the doctor's program medical like medical director etc as data when the when the doctor sees the patient so mm -hmm. really simple if they don't if that doesn't happen you've got to wonder why and what happens if it doesn't appear in the software i would suggest the doctor probably doesn't want to know about it because the minute Let's say if if a patient brings in some data to the doctor uh, and says, "Have a look at this," the doctor probably doesn't want to do it because the minute he or she looks at the data, they're taking professional responsibility 
that they've seen it and therefore the treatment's going to change because of that, those readings, which is unfair on the doctor. So that's one yep. thing. So if the system doesn't work like that, you've got to work out what are you doing about it. If you're seeing the data, are you diagnosing, are you the transit to the doctor or are you the transit to a back office somewhere for an app that you don't know who makes the clinical decisions? So one of the, the other way of looking at it is any app uh, that's used is basically an aid to clinical support. So yep. I might be getting a bit too technical, but I, I, I think that's how you've got to firstly look at it. Um, yeah. And then for anything, call it back office for pharmacy, uh, it appears to me that it's not apps at all anymore. Uh, uh, it's everything going through the cloud uh, and working yeah. backwards. Uh, and the key word is, or key words are collecting data, health data, uh, and then the other one is integration. How does it integrate into other systems? So, for instance, into doctors' uh, systems or hospital or whatever. Uh, so they're the critical yeah. issues. So that that's maybe that's not what I thought that you would have thought I'd answer. But no, no. Um, anyway, that's how I look at it. And then you and you find out which are really good. And and the other key thing is who owns the data and who's monetizing it. Uh, yes. so, uh, some of the the apps that we that uh, I have seen. Uh, the pharmacy, or well, the pharmacist does not own the data at all. Uh, so I suggest that's a problematic model. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a, a great answer because, again, it's um, it's coming from where your mind is at and I guess you're, you're in a position where you're coaching and providing support to pharmacy owners. So these are the things that you would look at and therefore some of the things that uh, a pharmacist or, or someone in the industry today um, looking at this world of technology that you know, should be integrating with it. And again, ultimately, there could be someone listening today that's just as likely to give you a call and say, hey, Mark, I heard you the other day. Can we talk a bit more about this? And I think that's what I like about this industry is the fact that there is competition within the industry, but again, this peership is that you can ring and, and touch base with someone and, and just get a, a different point of view. And I think that's really good from that perspective. Very happy so, to talk I, to you. If I say that back to you, um, from my perspective, it's uh, it's one thing to have a technology platform in your pharmacy um, or, or a customer app, but really, before you jump into it, understand um, what, either, what, what each stakeholder interaction is, I think is what you're saying. Yeah, correct. And uh, I'll add, uh, I do work for pharmacists who get into sort of professional trouble, let's say, that have to report to APRA and the pharmacy board and I'm getting quite reasonable at sort of working out what the needs are and I yeah. always look at that filter. So what systems are in place to mitigate uh, risk? So what's your risk management strategy? And not having a control of your data, for instance, is just such an obvious problem. It's very hard to defend if you don't have a good risk mitigation strategy. So someone not if you if you don't have any control of your data and you don't know who has, you're just looking for trouble. Yeah, I think so. Mark, we're well, like, coming to the end of our time. Is there anything else on your list that uh, you want to uh, highlight or chat about today? Yeah, um, I'll, I will say that I think uh, we haven't seen anything. I think the we're really at a cusp of uh, call it artificial intelligence and machine learning and which we just never seen anything like it and it's the artificial intelligence is just rolling through different industries and it's just started touching pharmacy and there's going to be just incredible amount of positive change and it'll be probably even more than the idea of going from prescription books to electronic going from where we are now, electronic, to incorporating artificial intelligence and machine learning, you just never see anything like it. It's going to be fabulous. So again, yeah. you've got to be careful, uh, pick your suppliers and make sure all your security in place 
and see what everyone else is doing. But we're going to be in a really good place. And, and I'm just sorry I'm not, you know, 50 years younger <laughs> starting <laughs> starting all again. But you wouldn't know what 50 years younger is, of course, Scott. But, uh... <laughs> no, well, maybe, maybe not. Anyway, no, that's been great, chat. I really thank you for your time and, and appreciate you uh, joining us on the podcast. Um, I'll include your contact details in the show notes should anyone uh, listen today be interested in contact with you. I'm sure you'd be happy to have a chat with them. Very happy to, Scott. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for your time today. Thank you for listening today. Pharmacy View is a technology-focused podcast provided by Melbourne-based business Arian Technologies and Shopfront Solutions. Over the podcast series, our guests include pharmacists, retail managers, wholesalers, suppliers, and industry technology partners. If you would like further information on our podcast series or to participate in one of our episodes, feel free to send me a message or touch base through the Pharmacy View website, pharmacyview.com.au.